is it okay one second yeah hello good evening everyone good afternoon and good morning to all of you who, who are watching from elsewhere and uh, today we have a uh, professor dr daryl baumgartner uh, he is the chief scientist and one of the founders of uh, droplet measurement technologies llc and uh, he worked at uh, uh, research aviation facility at ncar um uh, that is the national center for Atmo atmospheric research in the united states and uh, he was also a professor and uh, senior scientist at uh, universidad national autonomy de mexico or uh, the largest university in the latin america and one of the finest scientists i have ever met and uh, he is also a great expert on aerosol and cloud particle measurement measurements and technology and uh, many of the instruments we use in airborne campaigns uh, actually it is uh, he has uh, his uh, finest hand on him and he is from droplet measurement technology let us welcome uh, uh, professor dr daryl baumgartner to give this uh, lecture thank you so much for accepting our um, uh, invitation and giving this talk peril thank you so much and please start your talk thank you thank you very much dr tara and thank you for your team for inviting me to um, give a lecture at this uh, very nice seminar series that you've created here uh, and we're going to turn off my camera here and i'd like to also thank my co-presenters, um, Alex Hurst and Eric Fru from the University of Colorado. They're the ones that developed the aircraft system. I'd also like to thank uh, Masataka Murakami and Narihiro Orikasa, uh, whose data I'm using uh, for uh, testing the simulation and developing uh, the algorithm. So, Also, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that this work was conducted as part of a project uh, that was called Targeted Observation and Seeding Using Autonomous Unmanned Aircraft Systems. This was part of the United Arab Emirates Research Program for Rain Enhancement Science. So here's a roadmap of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to give you a very brief history of cloud seeding just to give you a feel for what's been done in the past. Then I'm going to talk about the sort of challenges that we have when trying to seed clouds to change their uh, microphysical processes. That will lead me into talking about the development of the algorithm uh, for cloud seeding. And then I will show you some uh, preliminary uh, work that has abundant uh, with the cloud seeding algorithm uh, using an unmanned aircraft system, wrapping up with a summary with an ongoing work. So first, a bit about the short history of cloud seeding. So cloud seeding has been going on for quite a few years. Uh, even back in the 19th and the 20th centuries, a number of different attempts were made to try to alter the properties of clouds, in particular, exploding gunpowder uh, uh, through either rockets or balloons, trying to enhance precipitation. And also in the 1920s, uh, there was uh, a several year effort of actually seeding with electrified sand that was thought to be able to increase the probability of precipitation development. This is a nice little cartoon from a magazine called the Literary Digest. This was quite exciting stuff back then that maybe you'd be able to make your own rain. All you need is magnetized sand. But it got very serious then in the 1950s uh, when a project was first started in 1946 by Irving Langmuir, Vincent Schaefer, and Bernard Vonnegut. This is the front page of the Time magazine back in 1949. Uh, and what happened was that they saw that by using dry ice in a chamber in the laboratory, they were able to form crystals out of what seemed to be just humid air. 
But then they recognized later that this rapid cooling brought about the ice formation on what we now know as ice nuclei, nuclei or ice nucleating particles. This is just a couple of nice photographs on the left. Uh, you see those scientists uh, filling uh, dispensers with dry ice that were going to be released from this um, um, uh, aircraft. And on the right, you see photographs to show where they had done the seeding. And these tracks are actually uh, where the um, showing they have modified the cloud properties uh, by dispensing the dry ice in, in the cloud. But the real question is, does cloud seeding modify clouds? Well, probably one of the most striking examples is what we call inadvertent cloud modification. And this is the now very well-known um, photograph, satellite picture of ship tracks, where these are actually, these are not the smoke plumes from uh, ships, but these are actually uh, cloud droplets being formed onto the uh, cloud condensation nuclei being produced from the emissions from the ships. But it's not a simple thing to change the properties of a cloud. I'd like to use this photograph from my colleague and friend, Stefa Borman at uh, the Mainz Institute. Uh, this shows all the very uh, complex pathways that you can form precipitation where all you do is you start with an aerosol particle and water vapor. But as you can see, after forming a droplet or an ice crystal, many other sorts of processes can happen uh, through the processes of condensational growth, coalescence, aggregation, rhyming, and all of these can happen independent or dependent upon one another. These microphysical processes are linked by a number of different other environmental factors. First of all, the composition of the natural aerosol particles. Then the available water vapor. But the vertical profile of temperature and pressure is also critical to the development of clouds. And adding to that, the upward and downward air motion we also have to take into account the release of latent heat by condensation or the extraction of heat by evaporation. And last but not least, the entrainment and mixing at cloud edges of cloud-free air. So these seven environmental factors are not independent, but they're constantly interacting with one another throughout the lifetime of a cloud. So throughout its history, as I show here, the modification of clouds has been focused on a number of different types of modification. First, of course, is the enhanced precipitation. This is to uh, mitigate drought uh, through producing additional rain or snowpack. The suppression of precipitation has uh, used cloud seeding in order to mitigate hail and flood. And the mitigation of fog on highways and airports, um, they use cloud seeding to try to increase visibility. And also seeding has been used to try to decrease uh, it, lightning through uh, doing forest fire mitigation. As I previously said, there are seven interdependent environmental factors that modulate the formation and the evolution of cloud droplets and precipitation. However, with the exception of exploding things in clouds, cloud modification through human intervention has relied only upon the modification of the natural aerosol population. So this is a very simple but pretty well-known conceptual model for how precipitation forms in warm clouds. So you start with aerosol particles, and we can call these seed particles, whether they're natural or artificial, and you start with these seed particles, CCN or ice nuclei at cloud base. As they rise in the cloud, the air cools until the relative humidity exceeds 100%. And then as these CCN activate, they begin to grow through condensational growth. 
as they continue to grow, they become large enough to interact with one another for getting collision and coalescence and forming larger drops. And then the larger droplets fall through these little droplets to form even larger drops, and they finally fall out of the cloud as precipitation. So nature has a pretty successful scenario for producing raindrops on her own. You have a uh, atmosphere with natural CCN, which can be sea salt or sulfates or other types of natural particles. Uh, when the uh, conditions are right, the cloud forms through updrafts by convective heating or other sorts of forcing. The droplets form, they collide and form drop, raindrops, and they precipitate. So that's a successful scenario. However, through human intervention, inadvertently, for example, the ship tracks, if you have many, many anthropogenic cloud condensation nuclei, then you can form many, many droplets. But if you have too many droplets, these droplets tend to use up the available water vapor, and then they don't grow to a large enough size to interact with each other. And hence, you have the cumulus humulus, or the small clouds in which no rain falls. Then you have nature's unsuccessful scenario, and this is the case where we'd like to try to help nature along. You have natural CCN that form the cloud drops, but there's not enough of them in order to grow to the larger size in which they collide and form raindrops. <clears throat> and so what we like to try to do in this case is to help along nature by using artificial hygroscopic CCN. These now form large droplets quicker, and they then interact, and they form precipitation. So this is kind of what hygroscopic seeding is all about. <laughs> However, for the most part, most commercial seeding relies upon the experience of pilots who've done a lot of this type of, of work before, and they know what to look for in terms of the clouds that would hopefully uh, respond to seeding the best. So it's pilot experience and luck. So once the pilot gets the cues from looking at either these very uh, developing cloud tops, a nice firm cloud base, which means a low cloud base, then they can look at this cloud and decide that this is where the seeding material should be placed. However, effective targeting is probably one of the most understudied areas in cloud seeding in general. So it's our premise that science-driven seeding based on observations should be used to maximize the probability of a positive impact of seeding on precipitation enhancement. And what is very important here to minimize the probability that the seeding will have a negative impact due to unintentional precipitation suppression. So we don't think that cloud seeding should be a hit or miss proposition. So I want to emphasize that scientific studies that seek to investigate the effectiveness of cloud seeding do so by applying statistical tests that try to address this question. If precipitation forms from a seeded cloud, would that cloud have formed precipitation even without seeding. If it would not have, then it's considered to be a effective or positive outcome. But a question that is, I think, just as important, but is rarely, if ever, addressed is, if precipitation does not form from a seeded cloud, would that cloud have developed precipitation without seeding? In other words, did the seeding have the opposite negative effect from what was attended? And this is one of the important points that I want to continue to make throughout this talk, that using the approach that we are taking, we are trying to do to avoid the negative effect as well as enhance the positive effect. So the development of the cloud seeding algorithm has the goal to derive a seed, node seed decision, and for precipitation enhancement, made in real time from an instrumented UAV, and in this case, that would be operating in the UAE. 
So the first step, we wanted to analyze aircraft measurements of clouds that were previously made in the UAE. And this was done by the uh, professors Masataka Murakami and Arihiro Orisakasa in 2017 in the autumn of September 5th to 24th. And they were flying over the UAE, over this part of the UAE, over the mountain range uh, that separates the UAE from Oman. And these measurements were analyzed to develop the warm cloud model that would rep be representative of clouds that form over the UAE. And all of these dots just, just is a compendium of all of their flights and showing where they were flying through clouds that were formed over the different parts of this area. And so from this, we were able to compile a number of statistics. On the left-hand side, this is a uh, figure that shows the vertical velocity as a function of pressure for all the flights. And we see that the vertical velocity varies from about minus 10 to plus 10 meters per second. Likewise, on the right-hand side, the black dots show the cloud condensation nuclei that were measured with the droplet measurement technologies CCN100. And you see that the uh, number concentration of CCN varied by about an order of magnitude from about 100 to 1,000 per cubic centimeter. And the other variable that was important to look at is how did the lifted condensation level uh, temperature vary from flight to flight? And we see that the LCL varies from about my, uh, 5 degrees up to about 20 degrees. And so we are going to be using the LCL temperature and pressure as our cloud-based temperature and pressure in our simulations. The first thing we wanted to do is see how well does the LCL actually represent the cloud base. So on the figure on the right, this is just from one flight. In the red dots, these are the measurements from the forward scattering spectrometer probe, the droplet spectrometer. In blue is our temperature sounding. And uh, sorry, in black is our temperature sounding. In blue is our uh, dew point sounding. And then the green line is the LCL that was predicted from the morning sounding. And the dashed line is the LCL that we found actually from the flight data. And you can see that they are very close to the actual uh, lowest cloud uh, measurements, lowest altitude the cloud measurements were made, which we can conclude to say that for a prognostic, the LCL is a good place to start for positioning aircraft and initializing the model near the cloud base. The second thing is that in addition to the CCN that were measured at uh, 0 0.5, 0 .0, between 0.2 and 1% supersaturation, the measurements also used a passive cavity aerosol spectrometer probe uh, to measure the number concentrations. And what we see from those various flights is that the CCN concentration could be very well predicted from the PCAS concentrations over the whole size range. Hence, in our UAV and instrumentation on the uh, small aircraft, we are going to use a separate measurement of aerosol concentration that is not CCN, but we're going to use it as a proxy for the CCN. And we'll talk about the, P, uh, the POPs later. So from this, we wanted to develop a warm cloud microphysical model to validate uh, the aircraft measurements. And it's a very simple but well-used uh, algorithm using simple dynamics, in other words, a constant updraft velocity, assuming adiabatic ascent based upon the cloud-based temperature and pressure. And at this time, we are not introducing any latent heat-induced dynamics. And the CCN compensation, we're assuming is sea salt with a log normal distribution. And we're hygroscopic seeding uh, simulated by just increasing the tail of the observed CCN spectrum. 
we're using the condensational growth implemented by HAL uh, and collision and coalescence initiated when droplet diameter exceed 28 microns using a stochastic coalescence scheme that was first introduced by Gillespie in 1976-1977. We run the model until the drizzle forms and, no and note the time of when the drizzle forms and then we vary the concentration of the CCN along with the cloud based temperature and the vertical velocity. So after developing this model, we tested it against all the different flights and we see that for the most part, the modeled, uh, the modeled number concentration, depending upon which updraft velocity we used, uh, matched reasonably well with the measured number concentration. The uh, adiabatic water content uh, that was uh, simulated also matches quite well with the me uh, measured liquid water content, as did the uh, droplet mass weighted diameter predicted by the model and compared to the measurements. So then the next step is to develop the algorithm to simulate seeding with hygroscopic particles over the whole range of environmental conditions and then determine what are the ideal conditions for producing positive effect and minimizing adverse effects. Finally, we parameterize these results and develop the seed, no seed algorithm for real-time implementation. So in short, what we have using the LCL that is first predicted from the soundings on the left here uh, is a case where the LCL was 25 degrees, on the right an LCL of five degrees. And we run the model, and for each case where the time to drizzle is less than, uh, if, if you seed the cloud and you cause drizzle in less time than no seed, then that's a good seeding uh, signal. But if you seed and you produce a drizzle in more time than natural, then you do not seed. So in the left-hand case, this is our phase diagram that we use as a lookup table uh, in the algorithm. Low probability in this case is when the updraft velocity is low over all vertical velocities. But when the, uh, when the uh, LCL is colder, we see that over a range of CCN and updraft velocities, uh, we are in this blue zone where this would say, this is a good place to seed. So in short, if seeding decreases the time to drizzle, then seed. If seeding increases the time to drizzle, then no seed. And so what we developed is a dashboard that is used in the actual field operations. And this is what the operator sees. Uh, in the upper panel, there is a track plot where the track is color coded with whether it's in a good seeding zone or bad seeding zone. And then when the seeding decision is made, we get a uh, orange star. When the seeding is stopping, we get a red star. This is all during our, our simulation. In the right-hand panel, we see the, the probability phase diagram to show whether we're in a good or a poor region for seeding. So in this particular case, it shows good seeding. And then the bottom is just the time history of the flight of the aircraft showing the uh, temperature dew point history a dew point when we're in cloud and the seeding and not seeding. So here we see a simulation as the air, aircraft is flying. Uh, it enters into the uh, box that we would say we'd want to start looking to see it or not. The orange star said that we found a good condition. We started seeding. And then after so many minutes of release, we stopped seeding. We're going through cloud. Remember, this is from the Murakami air flight, so we're using their data to simulate. On the right-hand side, you can see that most of the time, the updraft conditions and the CCCN concentrations are optimal for doing the seeding. So then, the next step is we have the algorithm. Now we want to actually put it on the aircraft and test it. So the technical objective of testing it is to deploy a instrumented aircraft and using this autonomous um, algorithm, 
we want to actually in flight use it as real-time guidance uh, based upon the model data, radar data, and in situ measurements, and then evaluate it, how well it worked uh, in the actual seeding of clouds. So the planned operation is that from satellite and radar data, regions are located in the target area where uh, we would like to look to see for optimum conditions for seeding, we find the cloud base through the LCL and then during the actual measurements. And while we're measuring the state parameters, wind and aerosol concentrations, the parcel model is being run in real time using the table lookup. And then we calculate the height and time of the first drizzle and we make the decision to seed or not to seed. So this shows the sensors that are actually on board the aircraft. Uh, the printed optical particle spectrometer, this is a uh, aerosol uh, spectrometer that measures from approximately 0.2 microns up to 3 microns. This is what we're using as a proxy for the CCN. We have the multi-angle inertial probe. Uh, this is just the electronics for it, but the probe itself is a five-hole uh, gust probe that measures uh, the uh, vertical and horizontal winds as well as turbulence. It also has the GPS that measures the position and aircraft attitude. And then the cloud droplet probe, the droplet measurement technology CDP is there to measure the actual cloud properties. The aircraft itself is the Super Raven. Uh, you can see its size uh, next to these uh, students here that are operating it. The cruise speed is about 17 meters per second, has a wingspan of about five meters, and a payload capacity of about two kilograms. And depending upon uh, the flight conditions, it has an endurance of anywhere from about 2.4 to 3.6 hours uh, and a uh, line of sight communication of 16 kilometers range. So the the strategy is that we have actually two or three UAVs. One UAV is being, UAS is being used for doing the uh, seeding algorithm. The other UAEs uh, have the seeding material in them. And these aircraft are released after the first aircraft locates the optimum area for the seeding. This just shows an uninstrumented uh, Raven it gets launched uh, with a catapult. And as you can see, it's being controlled uh, from the ground by uh, this gentleman right here. See it again. Okay. So in the field operation protocol, you have the radar that is giving us the optimum uh, box in which to fly. Uh, to find the area of interest, the ROI. Uh, the data is being um, telemet telemetered to between the aircraft and the ground. You have the science operator who's got the dashboard watching the data uh, being transmitted in real time from the aircraft and the UAS operator who is directing the aircraft uh, where to go. And so with this particular scenario, Here's the operations flow chart. The first stage is on the ground. We load the temperature of the lift to condensation level. We also put into the uh, aircraft the location uh, where we'd like the aircraft to first um, uh, go to to target. We then ascend to the LCL altitude and the polygon board, the polygon here being the region of interest. All this time, the Measurements are being made of the vertical velocity and the CCN and the temperature, updating the algorithm. Once the aircraft is in the polygon, then the seeding probability is calculated using the algorithm. If that seeding probability is greater than some threshold, here we say 50%, then we say, yes, it's time to start seeding. Seeding begins until the material is dispensed. And then after the material is dispersed, then uh, the aircraft will continue making measurements of the cloud and environmental properties until it's time to uh, end collecting data and return home. If the seeding probability is less than 50%, 
then a decision can be made to continue flying and taking data anyway, or it can be uh, determined that it's time to go back home because the conditions are such that it would never be good for seeding. So the for a number of reasons, the aircraft was unable to do its preliminary checkout in the UAE. So instead, this year in September, uh, between the 9th and 28th, we conducted field operations in Colorado, Nebraska, and Kansas. And on a daily basis, uh, we were working with a group from uh, South Africa, a rural of uh, group. And this is an example of the daily forecast where you have uh, here uh, Nebraska and, and Colorado, Wyoming, Kansas. And this is a forecast of where the clouds were supposed to be moving. And the red circle was the recommended area of, of flight operations. And so this was in a region where the flight crew could easily reach it, either uh, from the University of Colorado, or they would go out in the field and they would spend the night and the next day they would uh, go out and deploy uh, the aircraft. And so this is just a um, video of one of the operations on the last day of the operations. And the aircraft is being prepared, being walked out to the field. You can see the clouds already have developed overhead. There is a CDP on top of the uh, UAS. So the operator is preparing uh, it preparing the catapult. Move ahead here a little bit. There you see the catapult um, elastic band here. And it's now launched and headed towards the target area. You can see the uh, cumuli that is forming out there. There's already a rain band that's being formed. And on this particular day, they, they're avoiding uh, the uh, heavy precipitation that's already coming out through some of the clouds. But the data is all being transmitted back to the uh, to the operator. And so then, this is the actual dashboard that shows when the um, aircraft is taking off. It first does several maneuvers in order to look at the conditions uh, directly over the aircraft. Over on the right hand side, you can see that the blue area is where it's optimum for seating. So at the moment, um, you can see that uh, several times uh, when it gets here with, with red, this means it's, it's good for seating. Over here, several times it would have been good for seating. And note that we are not at this time using a second or third aircraft for seating. This is just a simulation, flight simulation, to show how we would have done it uh, had we been in operation uh, at the UAE. The other thing you can see, it shows how much time is left in the flight based upon uh, the fuel load that the aircraft is changing. And so the aircraft operator and the uh, flight scientist have all the information they need in order to determine what the performance of the aircraft was and if indeed the aircraft had flown uh, in conditions that would have been worthy of uh, dispersing the seating material. So to summarize, we have developed an auto autonomous instrumented um, unmanned aircraft system for cloud seedings and operations have been developed and tested in a pilot field program. It is our opinion that this system greatly improves upon the existing randomized seeding that's currently used uh, for operational seeding and what's even more importantly, it decreases the probability of releasing material in a cloud such that it would 
decreased or suppressed the precipitation as opposed to enhancing it. In other words, to minimize the probability of negative seeding effects. All the components of the autonomous UAS cloud seeding system will be delivered uh, to the UAE uh, as part of their rate enhancement program. And a manuscript is currently being prepared for publication on this technique for the uh, Journal of Atmospheric Measurement Techniques. The next steps uh, are to uh, continue expanding the seeding algorithm to include other factors, in particular to in, for operation in areas where cloud tops are colder than freezing, we're going to be including uh, in the algorithm uh, seeding for uh, uh, cold cloud seeding using uh, non-hygroscopic, but using other types of seeding material uh, like um, silver iodide. So with that, I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention. And uh, for more information, you can contact me. You can also uh, open for questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl, for the nice talk. And uh, Mahin, are there uh, questions? Uh, there are not. Uh, I don't see many questions here. Uh, but uh, I have some questions to Daryl. Yeah. 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 Daryl, this is very fantastic talk, you know, because uh, as far as the cost involving um, uh, uh, involvement of cost in a cloud seeding experiment, I think your uh, this technique will really minimize it. And um, so, but then, um, uh, how much area it can cover in in one go? I mean, because uh, like in our uh, experiment, when we we found that the very large cloud base, and then we have to sometimes visually uh, detect a cloud because it moves along with the wind direction. So, uh, whether your technique will uh, take into consideration these aspects. Well, there's there's several advantages that you have with a unmanned system, and one of those advantages is that, uh, first of all, the aircraft does not have to be launched from an airport. You can actually launch it from a region that's much closer to where the clouds are expected to form or are already forming. So this this decreases by quite a bit. Uh, how much time it takes to get to the cloud and then stay close to the cloud. So as I said, this particular aircraft uh, can stay up two to three hours, and it has about a 15 to 20 meter per second uh, cruising speed. So it can cover, you know, 10 to 20 kilometers uh, per uh, per edge of the area, uh, which was for a small cumulus is about the same size that you would find in a developing cumulus. And we we also have, in this particular scenario, we're expecting to be having radar coverage that will better target uh, where the optimum area would be to go. And then the aircraft, the UAV, will stay within that particular area in order to make its measurements and to release the seeding material. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a question from Professor Devera. Um, excellent talk. Many thanks. Uh, is it possible to observe better the phenomenon of cloud to cloud interaction and interactions at cloud boundaries with ambient atmosphere uh, environment using an UAV? Um, if I understand the question, you're talking about things like um, uh, entrainment and mixing at cloud edges. Uh, that would be the interactions at cloud boundaries. Uh, and I would say definitely. We have always said in the past that uh, from a sampling standpoint from aircraft, uh, slower and lower is always better. And so with a slowly moving UAV, that means that you can look at small scale interactions uh, much better than you can with a very fast moving aircraft. Yeah, so exactly. I think the answer is yes. I think definitely with a UAV looking at interactions, uh, particle by particle, for example, uh, is a, it, it's a very good application. So thank you for that question. 
Uh, Daryl, uh, this CDP you are using in the UAV, this is of smaller size than the conventional one? It's a uh, lighter. It, it's the same um, physical size, but it's constructed from lighter material than the standard CDP. It's also, it's unheated, so we don't, uh, we're not expected to be flying in super cooled uh, water conditions uh, with this CDP. Okay. okay. So, is May I ask a couple of questions, Daryl? Yes. Yeah. One is uh, regarding the precipitation. You have only the CDP, which is uh, actually measuring up to 50 micrometers, and uh, you are not uh, uh, making any. How do you check uh, whether there is already precipitation in the cloud before uh, seeding? Um, um, that's also a good question because as you know tar with the standard uh fssp or cdp or any of the uh, ones that don't have polarization you cannot determine the difference between liquid and solid uh, uh, particles but one of our uh under development right now is to replace the cdp on the uav with our backscatter cloud probe with polarization detection which is, as you know, is quite small. It fits in the palm of your hand. And with the BCPD, we are able to differentiate between the liquid droplets and the ice crystals uh, in that case. So the, our, our next generation system will be using a BCPD, not a CDP. Yeah, that that is really, uh, that will be a very big advantage and advancement actually. And uh, I have another question regarding your uh, criteria, uh, where uh, when, when you are seeing that uh, the droplets are uh, uh, indeed, uh, the uh, seed particle is released and the rain is uh, delayed, uh, and then you are, uh, you are deciding that the, this cloud is not seedable quality, right? Uh, well, there's two criteria. The yes, the, we 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 look to see if with the cloud-based temperature, CCN concentration, and updraft velocity, with those three parameters, if the time to uh, create or to develop drizzle is less than it would be from the natural conditions, then we say seed. But if seeding would uh, actually de uh, increase the amount of time, that's actually suppressing precipitation. And so at that point, we say, no, do not seed. OK, but in some instances, it may be possible that the cloud may grow deeper or uh, may uh, grow into mixed phase or uh, if the, with a delayed precipitation. Uh, precipitation. So uh, have you not come across uh, such a scenario in uh, UAE? OK, so that you raised the other question that I touched upon in my summary, and that's that oh. we're now increase. We're expanding the model to take into account ice phase, because as you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Murakami has done the modeling to show that actually sometimes you might want to delay the formation uh, or the growth of the uh, droplets until they get to colder temperatures, at which point they form ice and then precipitate. So that's that's a completely different physical mechanism that yeah. at the moment we don't have in our algorithm, but it should be in the algorithm. You're right. So that's yeah. that's the next step. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, yep. One one more question. After that, maybe I will stop. Uh, the uh, how do you plan uh, this for a uh, operation? As far as operational uh, seeding is concerned, right now it is in the like you have made a prototype model, right? Or uh, or is it uh, at, uh, is it developed to an operational uh, stage? Uh, I'm sorry. Could you state that again? Uh, I'm not yeah. quite sure what you're asking. Uh, current uh, model U UAS, uh, is it uh, an operational model for the operational projects? Uh, could it be used or? Oh, the what's being used right now is operational. So okay. we had we had originally planned to take three UAVs over to uh, the United 
uh, Arab Emirates and actually do operational um, testing. So what's in the model right now is what can be used uh, right now, but only, remember, only for hygroscopic seeding uh, for warm clouds. Okay. And uh, the, Mahin, there are uh, there are several questions now. Yeah, there are two questions. Uh, one question is from uh, Dr. M. V. Uh, his question is: uh, Ambient Atkin aerosols above 50 nanometer contributes to cloud formation also, but also accumulation aerosols looked upon here. So, how will will you know where a drizzle formation will be quicker? Daryl, can you please have a look? Um. Well, the only way that Aiken aerosols above 50 nanometer, well, 50 nanometer particles are quite small, and the only way you're going to activate that size of particle is a, with a very, very high updraft velocity. In other words, you need very high supersaturations to activate 50 nanometer particles. So at the moment, um, we're using the we're using CCN that uh, were above. Uh, 200 nanometers, because that's what the well, actually the PCAST starts at uh, 0 0.12, 0 0.13 micrometers. So yes, these are a little bit larger, but because most of the updraft velocities in these clouds in the UAE uh, were quite small, you know, somewhere between one and five meters per second, then we would not expect 50 nanometer or even even almost 100 nanometer particles to activate as cloud droplets. But it's a good question. In other cases, in other environments, perhaps we need to take into account those smaller uh, particles that would activate at higher supersaturations. Yeah, I think this answers the question. Um, mm -hmm. There's another question from Dr. Satyanarayana Tani. Thank you for the nice talk. Are you measuring updraft? Could you elaborate on which instruments, uh, on the instruments and methods? Yes, I don't have a good picture of the probe itself, but uh, if you're familiar with what's called the five-hole gus probe, it looks like a pitot tube on an aircraft, but instead of a single uh, opening at the front, it also has four other um, inlets or four other pressure taps in a cross pattern, and with those four um, inlet, those four uh, holes in the in the probe, uh, we're measuring differential pressure against each pair. And so with that, we have vertical and horizontal differential pressures. And with those, you can get horizontal winds and vertical winds. And in addition, if you're sampling at a high rate, you can get the turbulence uh, values as well. Uh, um, there is another question from Professor Devara. Uh, under what atmospheric conditions the cost to benefit ratio in cloud seeding for precipitation enhancement can be improved. What is a success rate? That is a question that I have not addressed, but uh, I'm very happy that you asked the question because it reminds me that in our publication, that's something that definitely needs to be uh, discussed because it, it, it's a complicated equation on the cost to benefit ratio uh, because what are the actual benefits that we're looking for? It's enhancement of precipitation, but the cost, the cost that goes into both the cost of the aircraft, the cost of the instrumentation, and also the cost of being successful in, tr in seeding, or even worse, what's the cost if you have unsuccessful seeding and it actually uh, suppresses precipitation. How do you put a cost on that? But that's a but that's a very good question that we will address in the uh, publication. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Are there any more questions, uh, Mahin? No, I don't see any question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so. Daryl, uh, we want to thank you so much for your this excellent talk, and it is actually opening up uh, new avenues and opportunities uh, to advance science, not only cloud seeding, but uh, also yeah. to advance science. And uh, we uh, we hope to see more uh, advanced observations, uh, much more than what could be achieved uh, with the uh, 
uh, aircraft. So uh, I think uh, more advances in the instrumentation also will happen in the near future by you. So we really hope to, uh, hope that uh, the cloud physics will advance further with uh, this uh, new ideas and inventions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, uh, Mahen and all the team. And thank you so much for inviting me uh, to give this talk. And I look forward to uh, talking about this with you later. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Bye, Bye now. Bye. Uh, Makrant, uh, you can uh, stop uh, live streaming. Yeah, okay. 